Hello, I'm Ralph, and welcome back to our channel. It's my time, let's go. I want to thank you all for, uh, for supporting the channel. We're overwhelmed today. We've passed uh, the over 200 subscriber mark and over a thousand watch hours, which uh, I'm just blown away by. And I thank you all for taking the time to subscribe and hit the like button and follow us along. If you enjoy this video, please take the time to subscribe, hit that like button, and bring that bell. Uh, it all helps us grow and uh, we hope to keep doing it and put out many, many, many more videos for everyone. Today we're going to have a talk about cams. Now, I'm not an expert on camshafts, uh, but I'd like to put the little bit of knowledge that I have out there and uh, you can glean what you want from it and search the internet for other information. But I'm just going to try to put a basics on it because a lot of people ask me about different cams in bikes. I find that the biggest mistake guys make is uh, they go bigger, bigger, bigger is better and bigger is not always better. Uh, it really depends on what you're looking for. Um, most of your driving today is done between 2500 and 4500 RPMs for most people. Uh, they're out there on the road. The power guys, yes, they can get up on the highway and they can crank her out. But the average rider is in that range and you should be looking for a cam that gives you the ultimate most power in that range. So you know what your driving habits are, you know where you're at, putting a bigger cam in uh, that's going to give you all kinds of power at 6,000 RPM is not going to be uh, what you want to have when your bike is a dog in the bottom. So today anyway we're going to try to go through a few specs and I'm going to try to just put a broad picture of things there uh, of the little that I know about cams and try to explain it a little better so that you have a better idea when you're looking through the book and you're looking at the cam specs you can get a little better understanding of what's going on. So all right, let's go. So your camshaft is basically what controls your, your, your breathing on your engine and opens your valves at the appropriate times. It consists of, of four lobes like these on uh, shovels and evos and things like that. And on most bikes, even the twin cams on the individual ones um, have, have their lobes. So these lobes are what opens and closes the, uh, the valves. If you have a cam that's just kind of out of the box, the older ones will have no markings on the face. You know, I think after, uh, I'm not sure quite what year, 77 or so, uh, they started putting a groove in them so that you could identify the different years of cams and not put an early one into a, an older bike and vice versa. Most of the cams made by any kind of manufacturer are usually numbered right on the end like this one is as an EV27 from Andrews. Or some of them will have a marking on the lobe, um, which is distinguished like an N or something as a stock cam. So this is the basics of your cam. Your cam has a base circle in which the, the followers run all around and then there's a high spot on your cam like this. And this is the lift. This is how much your cam will make your push rods rise and how much they will fall as the cam rotates around. When they're on the base circle, they're basically in a neutral position so the cam is not moving at all. But as it starts to come around to the lobe, it rides up the lobe like that and then at the high point is when your valves are open the most and then it goes down and the valves close. This is a sequence of events that takes place each time the cam rotates on each separate valve. So the lift becomes very important as to how far your valve will open and close in the head and how far it will be close to the piston or close to the other valve. In a simplified drawing we can show you this, the rocker arm, the push rod, the valve and the cam. So each rotation of the cam, and when the cam comes around to the high point, it pushes up on this, this part of the rocker arm, which pushes down this side of the rocker arm and opens your valve. When it goes around and comes around to the, the downside or the base circle, the rocker arm comes back up and the springs bring the valve back up into place and hold it up against the head. And this sequence completes each time. And valve lift is actually how far the valve moves off the seat. You know, when it actually opens up, the distance that the cam moves the valve open is, is valve lift. It's the difference between the base circle of the cam to the highest point of the cam lobe. So if you want to figure out what a cam's lift is and you've got it and you've got no numbers on it and you can't really distinguish it and you have no place to reference to, you can take the base circle and the base circle being the same line that this lobe is on, not the, not the end round part of the cam. So if you take this measurement from the top, to the bottom of the baseline circle and then you subtract the baseline circle. Once you have that number multiply it by 1625 which is the rocker arm ratio on most uh, most bikes, um, most Harleys, and that will give you an approximate lift value. So what we're talking about is this baseline circle here. 
There is a round spot on the cam and we don't want you measuring that, but the continuous lobe all the way around. So this baseline circle here, we'll start out by taking this measurement here across the top and just rocking it until we get something that's approximate. And in this case, 1.364. So we'll put in 1.364. And then we're gonna measure the baseline circle here, which is this part here. And just keep rocking it till you get you get a measurement that's pretty consistent. And we've got uh, 1.065. So we'll subtract that from our first number, 1.065. That will give us 0.299. Now we're going to multiply that number by 1.625. That gives us about 485.8, which is fairly close. And when I look up the specs on this cam, this is an EV27, it tells me that it has a 495 lift. So we're pretty close to that, 485, 490. Um, it'll give you a, a rough estimate of where you're at. All of the cam specs that are shown are in degrees of rotation. Crankshaft degrees are always the same. RPM is what changes everything. The sequence of events happens in a very, very fast as the rotation continues. The crankshaft itself actually completes two complete revolutions, uh, and that's what makes it four strokes of the engine cycle to make this happen, while the camshaft is only completing one revolution during the same time. The camshaft actually turns at half the speed of the flywheel assembly. One of the important things to think about is lift. And the lift is actually how far the valve moves off the valve seat and actually opens up. And this is your lift on your cam. It's the difference between the base circle of the cam and the highest point of the cam. The valve tappets, so or the lifters, are what moves up and down around your cam follower. You know, they're your cam followers and they run around the face of the cam there and go up and down and up and down with the lift. They push the push rods up which pushes the, pushes the valve down. Um, the valve, when the, when the push rods go down, the valve is closed by the pressure on the valve springs. Um, so that's why it's important to have your correct valve spring pressure uh, and have your valve pack stacked right so that it's closing it the way it should. Um, the higher lift the cam, uh, the more higher lift the valve springs, usually the high pressure the valve springs are, uh, but there can't be too much pressure, so they have to be set up just right. Rocker arm ratios um, can make a difference in this effect and some are, have a different ratio but uh, they're usually listed by the manufacturer. For example, all the ratios for Evo's twin cams 86 and 103s that I know of, uh, the, basic, uh, the basic number is 1.625 is the ratio. I think they've changed it on the Milwaukee 8 but I, I'm, I'm not right up on those sort of bikes so I can't say but I, I did hear somewhere that they did do a 1.6. So you basically get one and a half times the lift up here or pressure downward uh, than the actual lift of the cam because it's 1.625 times greater. So the op opening the valve longer allows you to get more fuel air in the cylinder and more efficient exhaust gas removal. Um, if you think about it like anything that you use, uh, your garden hose when you're washing your car, if you turn it on just a little bit, um, that's all you get. But if you open it up full blast, uh, then the uh, the flow becomes unrestricted and just flows out through there. So you might say that you, I want more lift to gain power. I mean, that, that's the way to go, but there, there's big limits to lift. Uh, one of those limits is the valve spring pack itself. And this valve spring pack, let's just put that there. I'm not much of an artist, but the valve spring pack comes with this different sorts of strengths of springs. If you're going to a, an upgraded cam, you know, a high lift cam, you have to or you should increase your valve spring pack unless the manufacturer says it's okay with stock cams, right? Springs can only be compressed so far and then you can get coil bind, which is springs hitting each other and not allowing for any more movement. Um, that's called coil bind and that's pretty extreme if it's allowed to happen. If it does happen, uh, the results are catastrophic and things start to blow up and we don't want that to happen because basically, the cam will try to compress that down even farther so your push rods will bend, you, your valves will bend, there's all sorts of things that can happen and uh, the events won't be pretty. Now you might say springs are springs and uh, I've got these springs sitting beside these springs and then they both seem to be the same height so they should work. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that if you run the lighter springs uh, with a high lift cam, uh, the, quickly the springs will become fatigued and they'll lose their spring pressure. and uh, then they won't, uh, 
they won't work properly at all. They won't have the power to close the valve like they should tightly in each event. And uh, once they get sort of spongy, then it can uh, contribute to valve floating, what they call valve floating because the springs are not doing what they're supposed to. Instead, they're hitting an high RPM and they're, they're starting to flutter is what's happening. Uh, and they don't want to close. You also got to make sure that the valve spring collar doesn't make contact with the valve guide or the valve guide seal. You could take this measurement and make sure from the bottom of the valve spring collar to the top of the valve guide to make sure there's enough room for the lift there. There should be a little extra uh, to allow for your seal as well. Many of your cams will show that stock spr valve springs are just fine to use and they will list that along with the cam specs to say this is good for stock, this is good for stock, need valve work, need head work. Uh, when it says those sort of things, don't scrimp out. Um, using, using your stock, cam, stock springs on a high lift cam uh, will just bring you problems. They'll get fatigued, they'll, they'll soften up, they won't work properly at all. Most are okay for street applications, but if you're increasing things, and that's the direction you want to go, if you're just an everyday, then do everything that's got to be done. If you're just an everyday guy that's running around on your bike and, and most of your RPM range is between 2500 and 4500, uh, then you should be looking for a lower duration cam and not a high duration cam. You'll get more power in the mid range and the pole range. Uh, that's why you see a lot of touring bikes today uh, with low lift cams, uh, you know, with low duration cams, I mean, uh, because they want some grunt when they're climbing a hill, when they're passing a truck, things like that. They're very rarely are they up over the five or 6,000 RPM range. Um, so that's where they want it. If they choose a cam the other way and uh, get something that turns on at 5,500 RPM, um, their bike is basically going to be a dog in the lower part of the RPMs. But if you're looking at your choices and they say in it, needs head work, needs head work, and it doesn't say stock, don't try to go without having that head work and doing it properly or take it to someone who, who knows how to do those sort of things and put the, put the valve springs in and the valve packs at the right height and all the things that are involved and making sure that you don't have interference with the valves. Now there's a lot of things you got to think about when you're picking your cam out and uh, you know as I always say if it can't breathe uh, it won't make power. Um, so you should be looking at your intake system. You know a good SNS carb set, uh, type of breather setup or uh, something that's uh, high flow is really what you need right to gain the full potential of the cam's abilities. Intakes and exhaust ports, uh, carb manifolds and throttle bodies all have an effect on performance and high performance gain. Porting and polishing can, can really help with a lot of high performance if you're starting to get up there and split those numbers. Uh, but don't be tempted to just get in there with a Dremel and start hogging it all out and saying, ooh, that looks nice and shiny. Because uh, what will happen is you'll end up with cannons there that'll perform at 10,000 RPM and uh, really don't want to even run anything below that. One thing you have to remember that, that when you have the increased lift, uh, your valve train components are, are moving faster, faster and harder. They're coming up quicker on the ramps. They're falling off the back. Uh, the valve spring pressure is needed to close them quickly. Um, but as it goes along, you have chances of more exhilarated wear on everything. Uh, more valve train noise, um, different kind of things that happen. It's not generally a case with bolting cams because bolting cams um, work pretty good with all the, the system the way it is. That's why they're called bolting cams. There's other things that got to be taken into consideration when you're going with a higher lift. With a higher lift cam, it's trying to force the valves to the side. You know, it's pushing on the cams, pushing on the cams. And uh, you can have extreme valve guide wear or even loosen up a valve guide as we had happen in Barry's motor. So the possibility of it destroying itself can happen. Uh, usually any cams with over 585 lift, let's say, uh, it's, suggest it's suggested to go to roller rockers and it, it kind of eliminates that pushing on the cam, on the uh, valve tip. Instead, it'll roll and play with the valve tip and it'll reduce that side thrusting pressure on the valve stem. So they're a good idea in anything over a 585 lift. So chrome molly push rods and forged rocker arms are very advantageous in this situation as they, they reduce any kind of flexing in the system. Um, you know, a little lightweight aluminum push rod uh, has a tendency to flex in, flex in there under the high loads that are put onto it by a high lift cam. So think about putting chrome molly push rods in your system at least and uh, that will help save it. Duration and intake. Long duration makes great horsepower. Um, the longer the duration, the more top end power. Uh, if you think of drag bikes, you know these guys are at the line. They wind these things up as high as they can. They're on the rev limiter as much as they can and pop the clutch and away they go. And they're pouring the coals to it all the way. 
And they've got long, du long duration cams in those things that are made to perform at the very high end of things, at the top end of speeds. And that's not what you want for your everyday street bike. You you hear it, uh, and an easy example is some of the hot rods that you hear out there. You see they got a blower on it and things like that. And uh, that thing's trying to idle and it's just kind of... It's because it's got a long duration cam in it. When they get on it, it'll work. But it's just barely allowing it to, uh, to idle and uh, doesn't give the right kind of power at the lower end. Your bike performs exactly the same way in those kind of situations. Very high lift cams as well need high lift, high compression pistons. And uh, once you start to match those things up with the high compression, um, of course they become harder to start. Very high compression engines uh, can create a problem with starting. Um, a lot of times you're putting on heavier starters and trying to turn them over. Uh, but the compression could be so great that the when the piston's coming up, they can actually the valve opens up the intake valve to bring the intake charge in there can be so much compression that it actually is pushing that intake charge back out and through the carburetor and uh, in some cases won't even allow the motor to start because it's just pushing it backwards uh, so compression releases are something that has to be put on these motors or should be put on these motors or else it, it can be a big problem on the other side of the spectrum is a, a long duration cam and a low compression engine um, the cylinder pressure in the engine will be greatly reduced and uh, although it'll turn over easy and be easy to start um, or possibly not want to start um, that's called over camming an engine where you put too much in it so you want to be careful about that you need the piston compressions to match up with your cams to get the full potential out of them uh, to operate that the way they should be operating so an, an average low compression engine will perform very well in the low mid ranges but not have any kind of top end at all uh, that you think you're going to get with that long duration cam. Most Harleys uh, running a mid range compression like a nine and a half to one and uh, shorter duration periods and a lot of times they'll top out at like a hundred, you know, hundred, hundred and ten. Uh, the only thing that saves them these days is the is the f six speed transmissions, which gives them another gear to click into, or the five speeds is better than the old four speeds. Um, so it gives them, you know, allows that power to be spread out over a bigger range so that they can get up a little higher. But for all intents and purposes, uh, they're generally topping out at around that mark. Uh, guys with five speeds and stuff, you see them 100, 110. Um, but the power and torque is in the mid-range and that's where it's it's wanted on most street bikes because that's where you're at most of the time in that 2500 to 4500 rpm range that's why your low duration cams are, are used in most touring bikes today they want to be able to pull up a hill with two on they're pulling a trailer they're passing a truck on the highway and they need that power right there um, so a mild duration cam is the best design for those going too high and a longer duration uh, you're going to start sacrificing things and I see guys and talk to them a lot about those sort of things and they always go well look at that one that one's got a little bigger lift and a, and a longer duration you know uh, uh, maybe that one will give me more power um, the reality of it is that most of the time they're not up to that speed and putting that cam in that's made for that um, they'll suffer performance all around mid-range cams give the best performance across the board that's what you're looking for. If you need big top end power, and that's what you are, and you're a horsepower freak, then everything else has to be done accordingly. Your valve train has to be toughened up. Put good, good Molly push rods in. Your breathing system needs to be good. It's all horsepower. I always say horsepower is measured in cubic dollars, but if that's what you're looking for, that's what you got to pay. Longer duration cams must have high compression. Must have higher compression pistons in them. Um, that's what they're made for. Um, so. Judge yourself accordingly. You can't do one without the other. And if you find that you need big top end and uh, you don't have the cam selection to get what you need out of it, uh, then you need a bigger motor. That's about it. So that's about it today for our uh, two-part series on cams. Uh, once again, I'm not an expert, and when I'm talking numbers and stuff going around, I I'm not trying to be very technical. I'm just trying to put the idea across so somebody has a, 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 a some sort of understanding as to lift and duration and things like that. So stay tuned for our second part uh, right behind it here and uh, check it out and hopefully by the time you're done it'll give you a good idea on what sort of cams you may want for your bike and why. So subscribe, like, ring the bell, uh, do all them things. Uh, we really appreciate it and it helps our channel to grow. Alright, we'll see you in the next video.